you know, no matter how much static there is in the environment, and Jeremiah compares the false prophets like birds chirping and things like that, and they just make a lot of noise. We once did a teaching called the bird cage, and the, you know, the, the minor birds are the only species that can say human words, which is one of the reasons I don't believe in Darwinism. It ought to be chimps or something like that. <laughs> Darwinism makes no sense. It's only birds can do it. But they essentially don't know what they're saying. They just repeat what they hear. And that's what happens now. People just repeat what they hear. We have cliche Christianity. Part of this comes from the sound bites of the internet tweeting culture and things like that. And part of it comes from the mantras pretending to be Christian worship, singing the same choruses repeatedly when the lyrics are not even scriptural. Uh, th this is what you wind up with. And then on top of, uh, into that environment, you've got the false prophets. This creates a lot of static. And it becomes difficult to hear the clear voice of the Lord and those whom he speaks through. It becomes very complicated. Not easy, you know, like static with a, with, on a shortwave radio. It's not easy to get the right signal. It's not easy. And before the Lord comes, it's going to get a lot more staticky. Hard as it is to believe, it's going to become more static than, than there already is. Uh, yet, there's always going to be the still, small voice. You might not be able to outshout the false prophets. Remember, Micaiah was one against 420. <laughs> In the days of Jezebel and Ahab, he was one against 420. But nobody knows who they are. Everybody knows who he is because he called it right. <laughs> Most people wouldn't have any idea who Hananiah is unless they really knew the scriptures well. He was the false prophet of Jeremiah 28, but everybody knows who Jeremiah is. They're always outnumbered. They're always outnumbered and outshouted. But in the end, they speak the word of the Lord and that's what prevails if they're truly directed by the Holy Spirit. Be that as it may, Work while you have the light. Night will come. No man can work. Let's begin looking at this issue. Turn with me, first of all, to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Bereshit Perak Aleph. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the term for God in Hebrew is Elohim, it's plural. Okay. This teaching, one of the reasons that we're in this present situation in Scotland is the Father created it through the Son. If it was just one person of the Godhead, it would use the inexative El, but it's Elohim. You know, it's, we read this in Proverbs 8. Jesus in the creation next to the Father in Proverbs 8 describes the creation. And of course, this is being denied, of course, by our former colleague and promoted by Studio Scotland here in, in Scotland. And I'm sorry about that, but it's Elohim, it's plural. Okay. He created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving on the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Light in Hebrew is or. In Greece, it's phos. And God separated the light from darkness. And he called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. Remember, Jewish people always count a day based for any ritual or religious purposes, scripturally even, the day is tabulated on the basis of the creation narrative. Or lahoshek, light to dark. 
It only depends on how many times the sun goes down, not how many hours or how many, what the period of time is. It's always based on the creation narrative. Okay. There's no good Darwinism. Darwinism is all rubbish. It's pseudoscience and atrocious theology. It's the religion of man. It's scientifically hideous. However, in response to it, creation science, there's both good creation science and bad creation science. Good creation science, that's an effective apologetic against Darwinism, good creation science requires both good science and good theology. Okay? <laughs> there's good creationism and bad creationism. There's no good Darwinism. Darwinism's all rubbish. <laughs> but there's good, cre good creationism and there's creationism that's not so good. And when people begin reading things into the text and thinking, you know, there's got to be this and that, you know. Remember, Genesis is not about the history of the creation. It is the theological interpretation of the history of the creation. In its own Sitzimleben, historical context in which Moses wrote it, it was a polemic against the pagan narratives. Genesis 1 to 11, things like the Epic of Gilgamesh. Well, other people knew about Noah and the flood and so forth. One of the reasons we can be sure of its historicity is that other cultures had these flood narratives. But because of monotheism, the Hebrews had the historically accurate and theologically correct understanding of it. But other people knew what happened. Okay. So it was a polemic against that other stuff. But it's not written as science, and it's not written as history. Now, what's in it has historicity. It's historically true. But the creation narrative is not intended to be read as science. <coughs> Although it's scientifically valid, God spoken into being. There was, there was a big bang, as the world would call it, if you, whatever you want to call it. And it is historically true, but it's not written as history. It's the theological interpretation of the history. Now this obviously has its parallel in the Gospels. The light and the dark, the true light comes into the world. Scotland, what does Scotland mean? Scotia, dark. <laughs> well, place lives up to its name. <laughs> No offense. <laughs> I have family from here. I'm not knocking a place. I'm just saying, you know. The Gospels are the same. The Gospels have historicity. They are historically true. But they're not written as a history book. John tells us if everything Jesus did was written, all the books at that time at least couldn't contain it. It's historically true. It has historicity but it's written as the theological interpretation of the history. You understand? If you read the genealogies, Matthew and Luke, and compare them with the genealogies in Chronicles and in Genesis, there's people missing. Why? Because the Gospel authors only included the ancestors of Jesus who were historically and theologically important to the point they were trying to make, that he was the son of David, okay, that he was the savior of the human race. They only included those. You know, it, now, it's true in what it says, but it leaves stuff out. Chronicles doesn't completely agree with Genesis the same way. That's how you get the rabbis. They say the New Testament deviates in the genealogies from the Hebrew scriptures. Yeah, but wait a minute, but Chronicles deviates from Genesis. The authors only included the ancestors who were historically and theologically important to what they were trying to say. You understand? It's historically true, but it's not the history. In fact, the book of Job, verse for verse, speaks more about the creation than Genesis does. And it tells us, 
from the scientific perspective, we don't know how God did these things, except that he did it through the Logos, through the Devar, through his son. Okay. Now, good creation science will know that. Bad creation science will read things into the scripture it doesn't say and try to make it into a history book or a science book. That's wrong. It's, that's, that's bad theology. Good creation, good creationism and good creation science requires both good theology and good science. Okay? Darwinism is, of course, it, 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 it's not just wrong. It's, it, Hitler and Stalin were both Darwinists, and they basically, and both socialists, and they took Darwinism to its natural conclusions. That's what they did. Hitler and Stalin, with their racism, they, they, Hitler and Stalin both took Darwinism to its natural conclusions. You ask these people, why do you want to save the whale? The whale's supposed to disappear. Why do you want to save endangered species? There's no logic in it, you understand? Well, why is their thinking so chaotic and illogical? Genesis tells us where there's darkness, okay, it was void of form. Two Hebrew terms, don't laugh, tahu and bahu. <laughs> tahu and bahu. Darkness, void of form. Something chaotic. Like when you have a software malfunction or a hardware malfunction in your computer and things make no sense, happen, just what shows up on the screen is illogical. You have to get a systems analyst to figure out what went wrong because it just, just doesn't make any sense. Okay, it just does not make any sense. It's chaotic. This chaos thrives in the darkness. There was some kind of cosmic catastrophe that took place when Satan fell. When God created the earth, he told Adam to subdue it. It had no imperfections, but it was not yet perfected. Satan was going to try to destroy the creation. In Romans 8, we read the creation itself, the biosphere, longs for the redemption, for the coming of Jesus. When man fell, the biosphere, his habitat fell. It all went, it all came under, it went into chaos. It was not supposed to be so chaotic. What happens with the killer of our age? Cancers. You've got an abnormal cellular <coughs> hyperproduction that goes out of control and the growth of the tumor or whatever it is eventually attacks the other cells and the person dies unless they get cured or healed. Well, basically what happens in cancer is intersystemic chaos, isn't it? <laughs> It becomes an intersystemic chaos. That is emblematic. It's signatory of when Satan is in control. This relates to why Jesus, by his stripes we are healed. Now, is healing in the atonement? Well, the answer is yes, but not in the way the word faith teachers teach. The Lord may temporarily heal us now, give us more longevity if we're ill, but healing is in the atonement, in the rapture or the resurrection. <laughs> when we get new bodies, we'll all be healed. By his stripes we are healed. It will be a reality. The most we can hope for now or pray for now is a temporary healing. <laughs> you Unless the Lord comes first, you're going to give up the ghost eventually anyway. That's just the way this life is. It's fallen. The whole creation is in chaos. Everything's in chaos. As we get closer to the return of Jesus, there will be fear and anxiety among the nations, none of them knowing the way out. There will be fear and anxiety among the nations, 
none of them knowing the way out. You can read economists, and they can tell you, medium to short term, what's likely to happen with the TI or the Dow, or the balance of trade. They can tell you. But in the long term, when they look at unfunded liabilities, pension funds, <laughs> There's a time bomb, and none of them have the solution to it. None of them. The United States and Great Britain have about 100% national debt. That's 100% of the GDP. Japan has 200. China is pushing 300%. Believe it or not, America and Britain are in relatively good shape compared to the others. Even really stable countries like Singapore, politically and socially very stable, it's got a 200% of GDP national debt. There's nowhere safe. There will be an economic chaos, and the economic chaos will trigger social and political chaos. From this chaos will emerge the Antichrist, you understand? Offering an artificial solution that people in desperation will embrace and believe. This corresponds to the darkness that's coming, but we can't understand the darkness that is coming until we understand the darkness that was. Right in the beginning when Satan fell, God sends the light. The spirit moves on the water. Now notice all three persons of the Godhead are involved in the creation. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whether Studio Scotland likes it or not, though the David Nathan likes it or not, all three. This. Well, where does this happen again? With the Tahu and the Bahu, everything is messed up. and the blah, 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 blah. In John's Gospel. Again, we see the same theme recapitulated. Look with me, please, to John chapter 1. Verses 4 to 9. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light, that light, the or, the false. There was the true light, which was coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, the world was made through him. Not per se by him, but through him. The Logos. And the world did not know him. He came to his own, being the Jews, and those who were his own did not receive him. The true light comes into the darkness. Now let's look at John. You see, that's the same as Genesis. The darkness permeates everything. The moral state of the Roman Empire and the political economic state of the Roman Empire when the emperor was deified and worshipped as God is a picture, a foreshadowing of the darkness at the end of the age. You understand? More about that this evening. Now let's look. John chapter 3, verse 19. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. 
but he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. <coughs> as we say <coughs> in Hebrew, the word for righteous, a righteous person is a tzaddik, a tzaddik. The word for being correct is, a, is tzadok. Okay? You're right, tzodek, a tzodek. You cannot be tzaddik unless you are tzodek. Unless you believe the truth, you cannot be righteous. Unless you believe the truth, you cannot be righteous. Men loved the darkness rather than the light. The light exposes the darkness. In Genesis, the spirit moves on the water, makes the creation. In John 3, born of water and the spirit, the spirit moves on the water, makes the new creation. But the darkness does not comprehend it. You understand? The darkness cannot handle the light. When Christ comes into somebody's life, something that is chaotic begins to take a logical shape with a purpose. <laughs> he straightens out the chaos in someone's life by putting them back into a right relationship with God. And once that happens, the chaos of their life begins to disappear because they see the light. They're not stumbling around in the dark anymore. Unsaved people are stumbling around in the dark. They've never seen the light, and they don't know what it is. But if they did know what it is, they wouldn't want it. Because it shows everything about ourselves, our fallen nature. Men hate the light. The world will always hate Jesus. He was the light in Genesis. Now, he's not a created being, but he was the light in Genesis. And he's the light of the world. But men love darkness rather than light. At the end of the age, this intensifies. It's what we call, it's a principle of Midrash that St. Paul would be familiar with and often used, Kalva Homer, light to heavy. Men always love darkness, but at the end of the age, they really love darkness. They really love darkness, to the point that the light cannot be tolerated. A symptom of this is where you see the words of Isaiah manifested in the social and cultural realities of the time. Oy vavoy lehem, woe unto them who call good evil and evil good. Men love the darkness, they will call that which is good evil, and they will call that which is evil good. They'll call homosexuality good. They will call abortion good. They will actually not just invent euphemisms, but invent new terminology to sugarcoat things that are evil. Non-therapeutic abortion becomes reproductive rights. <laughs> we go back to the 1970s. Chromosomally, there's only X and Y. <laughs> There's the rare phenomena of a super male, but a male is XY, female double X. Chromosomally, you're either male or female. Even hermaphrodites are chromosomally one or the other. And hermaphrodites are again anatomically rare. As a, as a congenital birth defect, it's anatomically quite rare. But even those people have a genetic signature of male or female. Okay. However, in certain languages like Greek and Latin and language and the Romance languages, a certain of them, 
Gender does not have to do with sex necessarily. Gender has to do with the way a word or term is used in a context. For instance, I can speak Spanish. Map, mapa, is feminine in Spanish. But you use the article, el mapa, it takes the masculine article instead of la mapa. There are exceptions. In Greek, in the New Testament, Petros and Petra. Peter is masculine, Petros, thou art Peter, upon this Petra. But Jesus, who was male, is called the Petra in 1 Corinthians 3. <laughs> a male can be called something female, a female can be called something male even. Gender is grammatical. It is not biological. You understand? Gender is a grammatical determination, not a biological determination. It's chromosomes that are the biological determinant. But because in language, a male can take a female form or a female can take... <laughs> Since the 1970s, they've been calling it gender identity. <laughs> it's only done with language, you understand? It's done with language to bamboozle people. They even invent a medical condition called gender diasporia. <laughs> I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. Yeah, I was a man trapped in a woman's body, then I was born. <laughs> These guys are nuts. It's done with language, you understand? It's done with language. But the substance shows that their language is idiotic. Somebody can legally claim to be a female or a male or whatever they are, a transgender or whatever they are, have themselves surgically re-sculpted to resemble a member of the opposite sex, they can do all of these things. But in a clinical reality, when they're in a life and death situation, <laughs> the physicians still have to go by X and Y. <laughs> Women are more prone to these side effects, men are more prone to those side effects. This is, you know, <laughs> you know, um, uh, that's just the way that it is. You can claim to be something, but that's just language. What is the substance? Okay. There is an immune disease that resembles arthritis and its symptoms, but it's not really arthritic or a joint disease, we're told. Um, but it causes a red butterfly, rosacea. <laughs> okay. Uh, what am I talking about, Doctor? Um, yeah. It's non rheumatoid, but it has rheumatoid symptoms. And only 30% of the people who get it are male. 70% of the people who get it are female. Somebody can have a sex change operation. <laughs> but if that red butterfly appears on their face, they're going to have to go on steroid drugs. And the dosage and the treatment is going to be determined on the basis of what they are chromosomally, what they are scientifically, what they are genetically, not what they are grammatically. <laughs> what they've done is replace the genetic definition 
with a grammatical one to make it socially digestible and politically correct. And you're supposed to live in this fantasy world as if that's the reality. But when you're forced to live in the real world and deal with the scientific reality, you see it's all nonsense. You see it's all nonsense. Uh, men love the darkness. They're willing to pervert their logic to accommodate it. The prophet Jeremiah used the Hebrew term evil, evil. He says, my people are stupid. We translate it in English. Now, evil does not mean a natural low intelligence. Avil, as best as I would be able to translate it, means they pervert their logic. They pervert their logic. My people are stupid. They are avil. They pervert their logic. Okay. Why? Because they love darkness. They try to make things that are wrong socially acceptable. And they play language games to do it. Now in the day of Jesus, this became so terrible that the religious establishment, the Sanhedrin, particularly the Pharisaic parties, were doing it. They use something called pill pull. So we get the joke, if you have two Jews, you have three opinions. It could mean this, it might mean that, it could mean the other thing. Bill Clinton was great at pill pull. I did not have sex with that woman. <coughs> yeah, but he very broadly, he very narrowly defined sex to mean intercourse. Uh, Jesus always interpreted the letter of the law in light of the spirit. Um, they began playing games with the language. You understand? At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it says, he spoke as one with authority, not as the Pharisees spoke. He didn't play word games. He interpreted the letter of the law in light of the spirit. He was direct and went to the point. This is what it means. You lust after somebody you're not married to, as far as God's concerned, you slept with them. You covet that which belongs to someone, as far as God's concerned, you've stolen it. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Men love darkness, and they become excellent at calling darkness light, at calling evil good by perverting their language, by giving different meanings to words than what the text would actually intend to mean. Instead of the spirit of the law, it becomes the letter and what you can make out of it grammatically. Remember Bill Clinton? When he was... Uh, uh, going to be impeached, he said, it depends on what the definition of is is. <laughs> he actually said that under oath. Of course, he was fined a million dollars, disbarred, and <laughs> as a lawyer, and guilt, found guilty of perjury. And if he wasn't in the position he was, he would have went to prison, but that's what he did. <laughs> he, he would have been a great Pharisee. They will always do this. They love the darkness. Those who are of the light will speak directly. Those who are of the light will speak directly. Men love the darkness. Again, think of the disorder lupus. It resembles arthritis. They get that red rosacea, but it's statistically more common in women than in men. 
Does somebody think by becoming transgender and having themselves surgically mutilated to resemble a woman that that is <coughs> going to one way or another affect their statistical probability or improbability of getting lupus? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. But men love darkness. Understand this. Just like the Pharisees, those who were in darkness will always play games with language. They will try to circumvent the substance with language. I watch preachers do this. The ones who beat around the bush about the issue of homosexuality and same-sex marriage. The Hillsong guys, like Carlin and, and, and Brian Houston. They do the same thing. Men love the darkness. They will circumlocute. They will give definitions to something that are not the reality. That are not the reality. There is not a physician in the world who does not know that intestinal tissue is single layer columbar epithelium. We talked about this. It is not designed for aggressive penetration. <laughs> Intestinal tissue is hyperabsorptive. You see that homosexuals who engage in this kind of activity, they're statistically much more prone to, to everything. I mean, all kinds of infection, certainly thousands of times more likely to get HIV infected than the heterosexual. And, and, and things that, they only seem to get most of the time, like Carposi sarcoma and things like this. <laughs> okay. Now everybody knows that. Every physician will tell you that. But of course, if you say it publicly, you become a homophobe. Yes, I'm afraid of sarcoma. <laughs> Carposi sarcoma. Oh, you're a homophobe. <laughs> I don't want to drink too much Glenmorangie. I'm afraid of cirrhosis of the liver. Oh, you're a whiskey phobe. <laughs> it's not logical, is it? But that's how it works. Men love darkness. Now let's look a bit further. Turn with me to John again, chapter 8, verse 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Remember, this harkens right back to Genesis. He's coming to be the light in the dark, and it's going to straighten out the chaos. He's going to take on the devil, who's the source of the Tahu and Bahu. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He's speaking of his disciples. All the others are in darkness. Now we go to John chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Here he is referring to two things. One figurative of the other what we call a Pesha interpretation. He is comparing his physical, literal presence at that time with the apostles. That he's going to leave them with the ascension to something that's going to happen at the end of the age. You understand? The darkness is going to come. Because the light is not there. Look at John 12, 
35. So Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. Remember, unsaved people, no matter how clever they think they are, they're stumbling around in the dark. They cannot navigate because they cannot see. The only ones who can see in the dark are the sons of light. The sons of light <coughs> was a major popular <coughs> eschatological term in the time of Jesus. When we read the Dead Sea Scrolls, when we read about the Essenes, they were all infatuated with the concept of being a son of light. There would be a conflict between the sons of darkness and the sons of light, the Essenes said. About that, they were right. They were wrong about other things, but about that, they were correct. Okay. But it was well known among Jews. This idea of the sons of darkness, the sons of light. Can you see in the dark? There is a technology originally invented in Britain, improved by the Americans, that was made as military hardware initially, that draws on background light from even things like stars reconcentrates the light optically so you get a green screened image and you can see in the dark that a soldier can see in the dark. The initial technology came from here. The Americans improved it. Um, you can see in the dark. They can actually see in the dark. They don't see as well in the dark as they can see in the light, but they can see. But this kind of hardware is not popularly available and it's very expensive. It's very expensive. Made, most things invented for defense purposes are eventually translated into consumer durables. They come into the commercial market. Like flight simulators, well that technology was first made to train American astronauts and then fighter pilots for the military and then commercial pilots and now they use it in video games. You know, it, it began as a space technology and a defense technology. But, then it, okay. but some of this stuff basically stays out of use of the civilian population generally. People are still using flashlights. These guys can see in the dark. <laughs> the sons of light will always be able to see in the dark. Not because it isn't dark, but because they're sons of light. When someone is born again, they become a son or a daughter, as it were, of light. Now, sonship, again, in Hebrew thought, is not simply pedigree. You become in the character of it. Sonship means in the character of it. We become conformed to the image and likeness of Christ. He was able to see through the darkness. He was able to shatter the dark. Just like the rising sun, the dawn, can shatter the dark. We can see. Well, we have to understand now. Jesus was telling his apostles, I'm going to leave... Work while you have the light. I'm the light. I'm here. Walk in the light. Walk with me. Because darkness is coming. I'm going to leave. 
you're going to be left in the dark. But you are going to have the means to be able to see in the dark to a degree. We see dimly, we see through a glass darkly, but we're not stumbling around in the dark like the world, like the unsaved. And he connects this with what is going to happen at the end of the age. A great spiritual darkness is going to come on the world and certainly on Israel that will climax with the manifestation of the Antichrist and false prophet. The false light. <laughs> Seeing in the dark is something that Jesus really emphasized in the last days. We often tell the story of the wise and foolish virgins. That parable comes from the Song of Solomon. Anyway, which was going to be read in the synagogue that very Saturday when he, when he told it. The bridegroom comes in the night for the bride. In chapter 3, she's ready and it's her best dream. In chapter 5, she's not and it's her worst nightmare. That's how it's going to be when he comes. Matthew 25, Jesus was just taken the synagogue and the temple liturgy, what was going to be read that week, and applies it to himself. He does the same thing with the Hallel Rabbah, Psalm 118, Hosanna, Hosanna, etc. Well, he does it with the Song of Solomon, both in John 20 and in Matthew 25. If you can follow what I'm saying. Does anybody not understand what I'm saying? You all understand. He took the liturgy from the temple and applied it to himself as the messianic fulfillment of it, what was being read that week liturgically. Everybody got it, right? Okay. Called the Machzor. Be that as it may. The wise virgins had oil in their lamps, as we would say, batteries for the torch or the flashlight. The foolish virgins will not have it. There will be faithful churches, faithful believers who will have the means to see in the dark. The others may carry a Bible, but there's no illumination coming from it. They are not illuminated by the Holy Spirit. They have flashlights, torches with no batteries. You understand? They will not be able to see in the dark. Daniel tells us none of, only the wise will understand. People won't know what's happening. This is something that also relates to the story of the Maccabees as predicted in Daniel 11. Those who knew their God would take action. Okay. So we have this idea of the darkness. He's going to disappear and it's going to be very dark and you're going to be left in a desperate situation. but you'll still be able to see, kind of. Not as well as you can now, but everyone else will be completely blind. You will see well enough. If you have the oil in your lamps to keep it burning, if you have night vision, well, let's understand this. We have to understand what he was talking about for his own time to understand what it means for the end. There is something called the Sfirat HaOmer, the counting of the Omer. It existed in the time of Jesus, it exists today, only a lot of abject rabbinic tradition has been added to it, unfortunately. We're only concerned with what's scriptural. Okay. The counting, or the Sfirat HaOmer, the counting of the Omer. The Omer is a stalk of grain. There is a 
50 day period, seven weeks than the moral day, from Passover to the Feast of Weeks, that is Pentecost. It's seven weeks and then the moral day. 50, okay, when the Holy Spirit is outpoured. In Judaism, this is called Ezeret Pesach, the completion of Passover. In other words, something happened at Passover, but it's not completed until the Omer is over. What Christ did on the cross, paid for our sin, made atonement, remember the two are different from last night, but then he said something else. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I will send the Holy Spirit. That's how we see in the dark. Now understand what I'm telling you. In John 20, he breathed on them. At that point, the Holy Spirit indwelt them. It's at that point the Messiah had died and rose that they were born again in the New Testament sense of regeneration. When Jesus breathed on the apostles, this goes back to God, again to Genesis, God breathed on Adam, he became a living soul. He became a new creation. In Genesis, he's a creation when God breathes. Now God breathes again, he's a new creation. The Holy Spirit indwells someone from the time of regeneration. But he tells them, go wait for the Holy Spirit. What do you mean? I've got it. Are you a oncer or a twicer? Now we've explained this before. One baptism, many fillings. Does anybody need me to explain it who doesn't know what I'm talking about? If you don't, please raise your hand. I'll go through it. Jacob, we need to break for lunch. We need to break for lunch. How long have I got? Five minutes? Ten? Two minutes? No, no, no. Take Okay. Okay. Jack and Jill meet in church. Jack and Jill fall in love. Jack and Jill get engaged. Jack and Jill get married. In the church, the preacher says, I now pronounce you man and wife. I present to you Mr. and Mrs. Jack and Jill. In the eyes of the law, Jack and Jill are one because they've entered into a legal contract. In the eyes of the church, they are one because of the nuptial liturgy and the preacher pronounced the man and wife. In the eyes of the Lord, they are one because they made a vow to God. Not least of all, they are one in the eyes of each other. When they walk out of the church, they are, object they are objectively one. But not until they consummate the marriage on their honeymoon are they subjectively one. Baptism takes that which is an objective truth and makes it a subjective experience. Okay? Now Jack and Jill wouldn't go on their honeymoon and say, gee, that was great. Maybe we'll do it again. I'll have a second honeymoon 25 years from now. <laughs> There's something special about the first time by virtue of the fact it's the first time. But it's an ongoing thing. Spirit-filled life is the same. When someone is baptized in the Spirit, okay, it's the first time. But we see the same ones baptized in the Spirit on Pentecost in Acts 2 are the same ones filled with the Spirit in Acts 4. The room was shaken. It's ongoing, okay? It's an ongoing thing. It's not oncers or twicers. It's something, the spirit filled life, okay. The Holy Spirit indwells from regeneration. The Holy Spirit outpoured is something else. One is an objective, the second is subjective. They may or may not be simultaneous. It's like water baptism. Somebody can get water baptized as soon as they get saved, somebody can get water baptized three days later, okay. <laughs> 
the important thing is to be baptized. Be that as it may, not only is the Spirit outpoured on Christ and onto the church, but when that happens, the church is empowered. You shall receive power. Our power is the power of Christ made possible by the agency of the Holy Spirit since Pentecost. Secondly, what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit in John will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. In the era of grace, instead of the wrath of God, like in the Old Testament, in the era of grace, there's the conviction or the eclenctos of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit will never be taken from His people indwelling. But His Spirit will not forever strive with man. The church will not be empowered. The world will not be convicted. God will revert to an Old Testament motif of dealing with Israel and of being the God of wrath again in the book of Revelation. Does everybody understand? Then th this happens when the darkness comes. Let's go eat. We'll resume when we get back. <laughs>